Hello, it's very nice to see you all again this last time. One of the things that I think has certainly come across to me, and I imagine you all have noticed it as well in the course of these few days, is that we are living in a time of tremendous transition within the industry. There are so many questions that have come up in the different panels and presentations that I think even 10 years ago weren't being asked. Questions like, uh, what form should a restaurant take? Is fine dining dead or is fine dining still a critical source of inspiration and ideas? Is lo local and farm to table a trend or is that a permanent revolution in how we eat? Do Twitter and Instagram and Yelp and all of those other things represent the decline of civilization or do they, <laughs> or Instead, do they offer new opportunities for communication? And most critically, where do our ideas come from? How do we keep generating them? How do they spread? Should they spread? I think all of these questions can lead to some anxiety because change always does to a certain degree. But they also represent real opportunities. They're exciting chances to think about what creativity is and what it can be. And that's what we're gonna be talking about in this closing session. So our first presenter, in the last couple of days, you may have heard Enrique Oliveira uh, talk to us about the very critical, I think, r uh, realization that he came to, which is that tradition, a, a cuisine, no matter how deeply rooted, no matter how old, no matter how grand, is never static. It's always an evolution. And I think because he sees the role of the chef as someone who guides that evolution, uh, he has been able to have tremendous uh, influence and been a really important figure. I think it also explains why his restaurant Pujol in Mexico City has, begun, has gone on to become the first Mexican restaurant to make the world's 50 best restaurant list. He, for me, is the perfect example of someone who represents what I would call the global turn in cuisine. And what I mean by that uh, is that someone who cooks with a profound sense of place of where he's from, but that also manages to turn himself and his city, not just into a destination, but into a real model for the possibilities of food. So please join me in welcoming Enrique Olvera. Good afternoon to everyone. Um, I did a demo yesterday, so I'm gonna try not to repeat myself. But certainly, I'm going to have to in, in some senses. So I, I like to start uh, with the beginning, because this is, I think, the most important part of uh, creative work is uh, knowing your principles. What you think is important to you, uh, your values, your core values, will be the, the things that will set your plate. Um, if you if you start with the end in mind, which is what most people tell you to do, um, you probably end up with something that you visualize, that you, that you dreamed of. If you start with your values, you know, for example, our values in Puyol are um, to be authentic, um, to be honest, to be careful with the products, then the dish will look like something. Uh, and it doesn't matter what it looks like at the end because if you have those principles, the, what you finish, uh, the dish will, will look like it should. A helicopter uh, looks like a helicopter, not because somebody wanted to make something beautiful, it's because it needs to fly. So to us at the restaurant, this is the most important part, to begin with your principles, to begin with how you think. Then once you have those, those uh, principles clear, what we like to do is try to think um, outside of the box. Try to think uh, not like our grandmothers did, uh, not because they were wrong, but because they didn't have the same amount of information as we do. So, for example, and there will be a, a short video that we will play later about an architect that I really uh, 
that I really admire. He has the couple of uh, buildings here in San Francisco, so it will also be pertinent. But I, the, the other thing that I like to do is, um, when I see what my grandmother did, I, I see an opportunity uh, to do something better. And to me, this is fundamental. Creativity must be, uh, it should be, I'm sorry for my English. I, I was in school for um, 10 years ago, so it's getting a little bit rusty. But uh, it should be encaminado, it should be goal-oriented to making things better. I think creativity for creativity is really bad because uh, I see uh, in some cases, if, if, you're too, if you're just being creative for the sake of being creative, um, you might do a lot of mistakes. Whereas if you're trying to be creative because you're trying to solve a problem uh, or because you're trying to do things better, then the result will usually be uh, so much nicer. Um, so having that in mind as well, what do we try to do in, in Puyol? And I also mentioned yesterday that we do not have an R&D department. Uh, I understand that creativity is also work. It's not something that uh, just comes out of your mind. But most of the dishes that we've added to the menu have started like that, just by observation, just by uh, going to a market and just like seeing things differently. Um, trying to, to also be authentic, try to, to be focused on flavor, which to us is uh, certainly important. So I'm going to show you the video. The architect is uh, Renzo Piano. Uh, you probably know him, uh, Italian guy, amazing architect. And I think even though we're in a food conference, if you change just architecture for food, this is the, one of the most amazing videos I've seen, and I've seen it a hundred times, and every time I see it, I, I get the point uh, across. So, enjoy it. Welcome to the weekly video podcast for the people in Square. This exclusive online program will... One minute, then. So it's part of, uh, okay, there you go. End of the process of construction today. So the building is almost ready. On every job, I love to be on site. The reason why I love it so much, I guess, is because when I was a, a little boy, I always preferred to spend time with my father on, on site more than going to beach or to the country. A site is a miracle. A site is a place where a lot of sand become next day something built, you know. It's a place of magic. So I, for some reason, I have that under my skin. Architecture is some kind of incredible mix of different disciplines. But construction is still a fundamental part of architecture. The art of making things, piece by piece. You just take a piece and you put together and you make the building. In fact, that's the reason why my office is called the Building Workshop. Because it's a place where we love to make buildings. I'm just saying that in this building we use low iron blast because we wanted to create that sense of, of transparency. This is really done to create the microclimate. Yeah that is acceptable. That is act actually, I feel it's fine. Good, actually. The, the previous academy was fine, but you are lost in the kingdom of darkness inside, okay? You, you never knew where you were. Now here, you are in the middle of the park. So I'm happy for that. It's a beautiful picture. Look at that. An architect is always connected to the past and is always connected to the future. You need the past because you need the, you need the memory. But you need invention as well. In some way, you have to be grateful to tradition. As an Italian, I'm very grateful to, to my tradition, but in the same time, I hate the tradition. An excess of tradition may kill you, you know, may actually um, paralyze you. So you need a kind of balance between gratitude for the past and desire 
of invention, curiosity for the unknown. There was a poet, Luis Borges, that said something beautiful about creation. Every creative work is somewhere between memory and oblivion. You know, you remember things, but you forget things. So because you forget, because you have oblivion, then you have a space in which you can invent something. For more information about E-squared, so, visit our website. Even though it's an architect, to me it's amazing how all the similarities, uh, the sense of place, which I think has become uh, really important to us, mainly because of globalization, uh, but also because, and this, I think this uh, is something that we realize, is that it, we as humans need to be a little bit different from the guy next to us. So what we want to do um, in the restaurant is, and I mentioned this yesterday as well, is the, that circle where we know there is no past and no future, but it's only it's one same thing. We don't believe that cooks need to be uh, need to uh, choose between being traditional or uh, or avant-garde. We believe that cooks uh, just should cook well, and also we we've seen that in the past decade or the past. 10 years, there was a big concentration, first in creativity, um, then in proximity. And this is, this is really good. This is uh, being creative uh, definitely has changed the way we, we have cooked or the way we cook. But we want to press another issue, which is culture. Um, in, in the video, uh, Renzo said that there's, uh, construction is part of ac architecture. I think. The same applies to us. Cooking is a part of cuisine, but cooking is not cuisine. Uh, cuisine is the, something that is much deeper, uh, that reflects the culture, uh, or at least uh, like good buildings will, will show you where you are. Good restaurants must show you where you're eating. Um, and I also think that we must remain, when you have something that is so precious, uh, in our case, Mexican food, you want to you want to keep doing that if you if you if you, if the the answer cannot be just to apply modern technique uh, or the most recent technological advances to the ingredients of your area um, there is there to us as humans i think it's also very important memory uh, memory what you ate when you were a kid uh, will definitely be a part of you for the rest of your life if you uh, as a kid, like my case, you eat quesadillas. Uh, a lot of the journalists like uh, to ask, what would, you die, what would you eat if you die tomorrow? Obviously, quesadillas, because that's who I am. Uh, if you ask a Japanese guy, he's probably going to say something different. Uh, so what you eat when you're young uh, will be also a big part of who you are as a cook uh, and how you see cuisine and how you, how you see that creativity. <coughs> Lastly, because I know there's uh, some people after me, this is, this is the, the most, imp and this is to us, this is very important. We don't, we see a big future in Latin America, uh, cuisine-wise. I know there's a, a big thing going on right now about Latin cuisines, but in order for us to be successful, in order for us to be um, the next big wave, as a lot of people will say, um, I think what we need to do is we need to be very analytical, uh, try to understand our cuisines, try to uh, get to know them, get to know our technique, uh, get to know our ingredients. And then the most important part will be how do we take that and project it into the future in our own way? In, not in a way that a lot of countries have done uh, that have been successful, like the US, like, uh, like a lot of countries in Europe. They have been successful in doing something that is their own, their own way. We want to do that. We don't want to, uh, if we have like a really good tomato that is uh, Mexican, we do not want to do tomato water because it's not 
the answer for us. We want to do something that is ours, uh, that it reflects who we are, that it reflects where we want to be. And um, I know it sounds really simple, but it's extremely difficult. Uh, because now with the information age, uh, it's, uh, sometimes I even try not to go to restaurants and don't look at the internet because I, my mind uh, gets, uh, gets, con gets polluted with all these ideas. So what we want to do is, wanna, uh, yes, we want to keep open, and Mexican culture has always been open. If you see Mexican food, you'll see uh, food that incorporates ingredients and ideas all the time. Uh, we're, we're good at that, We've, we're used to it. Uh, no, the Spanish came uh, and nothing happened to our, uh, to our uh, identity. We're still very Mexican. We incorporated ingredients, we incorporated uh, flavors, but the, the main identity of our food is still there. Um, this is what we want to do in the future. We're going to keep that authenticity, incorporating new ideas, new products, and uh, new ideas. So that's my participation for today, and um, thank you, everyone. Can I ask you, since we're sort of looking forward from here on out, could you talk to us a bit about what your plans for New York? I know you've said you don't want to replicate Bujol. How will it be different, and what do you envision for it? Well, I think the, since we do restaurants that belong somewhere, definitely the, the restaurant that we're, we're opening in New York next year, so it, it will not be a Mexican restaurant serving traditional Mexican food, or even the food that we do in Pujol, we're probably gonna just have a Mexican frame and try to use local ingredients. Uh, so we'll use uh, the flavor profile but we'll, it will not definitely, we, we, need to, we need to do something that is in New York. So it would be, how would be a Mexican restaurant in New York, but because it is in New York, it needs to be different. Okay, great, thank you, thank you, Richard. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. It is such a cliche to say that someone doesn't need an introduction, but it's actually really true in this case. Um, Thomas Keller needs no introduction. You all know that uh, perhaps more than any other person, he has imagined and achieved a distinctly American form of fine dining. And his restaurants, the French Laundry and Per Se, as well as more casual forms like Bouchon and Ad Hoc, all these years later still remain absolute paragons of hospitality and gustatory pleasure. You also know that he is renowned for his perfectionism, even down to making his cooks cut the tape that they use to label things, not tear it. Uh, I should say, as an aside, I remember when I, uh, the, first, the first few days that I was, I was at El Bulli, there was a whole new group of, of stagiaires in there, and 35 of them, and I would say, I think it was, 32 who were completely blown away by, by Ferran Adria's attention to detail. And then there were three who were like, I'm sorry, but this is just not up to our standards. And all three of them had worked in, in a Keller kitchen. <laughs> um, uh, he has also been a critical mentor for a generation of chefs who remain deeply loyal to him and grateful for what they learned there. Um, and they, as they go on to explore new possibilities, they still strive to uphold his, his standards. I was very moved, actually, this summer to see, uh, to be standing in the kitchen of Matt Orlando, who had been executive sous chef at Per Se, and had just opened his own restaurant in Copenhagen, and to watch him take out those scissors and cut the tape. So please join me in welcoming Thomas Keller. Thank you, Lisa. It's always uh, nice to be introduced in that way. Um, Enrique, where's Enrique? Is he still here? Did he go in the back? 
I just wanted to thank him for his um, references to quesadilla as a dish that if he was on his deathbed that he would be eating. It's a real strange, strange question for, for, to be asked of chefs, but it's asked many times, you know, what, what would your last meal be? And uh, there are four things I always say, uh, and one of them is a quesadilla. So, you know, it's a good memory, and, and I'm not even Mexican, but it just goes to show you how our reference points have, have changed, uh, certainly here in America and, and around the world. And the other thing I, I wanted to mention, because I, I, was, I was listening to his, his conversation, and he talked about going on the internet and this idea of pollution. Well, you've heard it here for the first time. It exists, culinary pollution, okay? So we have a new phrase to, to talk about and how um, sometimes we are influenced or we are bombarded uh, with so much information that it becomes confusing and therefore uh, pollution. I, I like that. I like that word. So I'm, I'm going to be using that uh, moving forward. Um, hopefully, we'll have time for a couple questions after. So there, there are some microphones in, in the audience, um, and um, we'll hopefully be able to get get a couple questions in. I want to thank first of all. I want to thank Dr. Ryan as always for. Um, just for supporting the, the, this type of event. Um, it's just, it's really great getting everybody here in one place. I also want to thank him for inviting me or, or not thank him. I'm not sure yet. We'll see how it goes. Maybe it's a good thing. Maybe it's a bad thing. But um, really, I appreciate everything that you do for us. Uh, I also want to thank all of you. I hope you've had a wonderful time here at the campus, at the school, and of course, in, in this beautiful valley, you've had some great weather. So. Hopefully you've got to enjoy that, some wine and some food, because that's what really we're famous for. Um, Greystone's World of Flavor Conference. This is our 13th one, I believe. Is that correct? 16th. 16th. Amazing how fast 16 years goes by. And this session is Driving Creativity in the Culinary World, Connecting Global Strategies for Next Generation Appetites. Did you all know that? That's what we're talking about? It's like, what a topic. I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's amazing. Next generation. Um, I, I remember I, when I used to be one of those next generations. Uh, but creativity is not, not what I spend a lot of time thinking about. And um, some of you may, be, may have heard me or read me, uh, or read uh, topics or conversations that I've had about that, that word creativity. Um, you must understand that, I, that I'm a person who lives, who lives in the moment. I do everything I can to be as successful as I can in that moment. Perhaps that is a chef's life. But now, now we are challenged to think about the future, how to impact it, how to predict what we need, how to make sure we are more prepared so that those we train and mentor will be in a position to continue their careers in a meaningful way with great success. I guess that's why I did not spend countless hours working on this presentation. You see, I've been immersed in what I need to do at that moment in order that my team, my business, and my life was organized. That's not to say that I did not plan for the future, because we all must, or we threaten our own existence. Now, I hope I've not confused you. I know I'm supposed to be giving you some insight and sharing knowledge about creativity so that you can all prepare and set up a creative atmosphere to ensure your success. But for me, creativity is an interesting word and one which I really try to avoid. I prefer words like imagination, inspiration, interpretation, and evolution, because therein lies what I believe is a more manageable expectation. I do not expect, nor can I switch on, creativity, nor can I expect it of my team. It is a burden that is too heavy for anyone to carry. However, what I can provide them is an environment where they have the opportunity to truly be inspired, giving them the confidence and courage
to share their ideas is a critical process, is critical in the process. I want to foster an environment where all voices are heard. I want to encourage a freedom of communication where ideas and opinions are expressed. I want to listen to those ideas and opinions. Lastly, the final step is to help bring to life those ideas and to celebrate their success so that we all feel empowered. This truly allows us a rapid rate of evolution and one that I believe is current to that moment. That is what allows us to prepare for tomorrow. For me, this is the creative process. We must also be cautious how we allow our profession to be defined. Culinary pop phrases, which are a product of the desire to drive trends, are potentially very dangerous. We've in the past had phrases like nouvelle cuisine, fusion cuisine, more recently, molecular gastronomy. All these are used to describe movements when in and of themselves are truly a form of the evolutionary process. They are passed down from generation to generation. We must not get caught up in labeling ourselves, or more importantly, from others labeling us. We must strive to continue the natural process of evolution and embrace those who act responsibly and with integrity. Part of our responsibility is to hire, train, and mentor the next generation so they are better than ourselves. If we do not accomplish this basic task, then we have failed. This is part of our obligation as leaders imparting knowledge and teaching skills to the next generation, thereby nourishing and assuring growth. As recent as this past Thursday, I finally accomplished a dream of my own. It was a very emotional moment. I was able to gather some of the most influential and esteemed chefs of the previous generation, those that inspired me and my generation. I wanted to express my appreciation and gratitude for all they gave us. Each generation influences the next. We must not forget the past. We must not take for granted their contributions. Reflecting on the past 20 years at the French Laundry, I, rem I am reminded of the many mistakes the countless challenges, and the many celebrations, all of which were unforeseen but critical in our evolution and realizing where we are today. Do not be afraid, for you'll experience the same in your path to success. Let us assure our future by embracing our individuality and maintaining a true connection to our philosophy and culture so that cuisine does not become homogenized by a continued quest to find the next new ingredient or technique, only to be popularized for a moment, then discarded for the next new thing. And finally, don't forget what we do is that we operate restaurants. The primary reasons we exist and thrive is because we invite our guests in, we offer a comfortable and clean environment with a professional, professional and knowledgeable team who service them and accommodate their request. We serve them good and wholesome food. Very basic, very simple. But I'm always reminded by one of my mentors that simple is hard. Let's not try to complicate it more than we have to. Lastly, as I always remind my team, our future success lies in the work we do today. I wish you all success. Thank you.
I think I think we have some some microphones in the audience for some questions. Lisa, questions? Anybody? Hands raised. Please come to the mics on the both sides of the aisles, if you don't mind. Or shout them. Okay. We have a few minutes. If any has anybody has any questions, yes, ma'am. You're legendarily exacting, as um, Lisa mentioned. And I'm curious, you know, you, you've reached the stature now that people would fight to be able to work with you and trim tape with scissors instead of tearing it. But what about a, a chef who seeks to be exacting but is just starting out or doesn't have the acclaim to be able to demand those standards of people working for her or him? Um, is that you know, how did you start doing that, and, and what's your advice to younger chefs who have those ambitions? Well, if you, you are who you are. Um, you, you begin habits today that will take you through your career. So there, there's no use in saying to yourself, one day I will be like that. Either you're like that today, and you build upon that strong foundation, or you're not. So when you go to work today as a young, as a young chef de party or a young comi or young sous chef in a restaurant, the habits that you are, are defining at the moment, your work ethic, the cleanliness, your, your, your attention to detail, all of those, that basic responsibility that you have will make you who you are in the future. You cannot start your future tomorrow. You start it today. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Well, a, a, an employer can expect it. You, you, can't, you can't really demand it, but you have to give, as, I, as I, I said in my speech, we have to give them the environment to, to really thrive. And it's a, it's a, that's the most difficult thing, is, is defining that environment where your team can live up and s exceed your expectations. And that's, that's really where you want to be. You want them to be exceeding your expectation by what you have been able to, to give them in order for them to excel. And that's, and that's an environment, whether it's, whether it's the physical environment, whether it's the tools, whether it's the education, um, the mentorship, the training, all of those different things that you have to supply um, to your young team so that they continue to thrive. Yes? I have some calories to work. <laughs> Thomas, you said that there were mistakes unforeseen to your path to success. Are you willing to share? Well, I, you know, I think there are many, many mistakes in your past. Do you think that you are going to, um, I, I think of the restaurants that, that, that I've opened in the past that failed. And um, you, you don't open a restaurant thinking it's going to fail. You open a restaurant uh, thinking that you're going to succeed. You take a job because you're excited by it and you think you're going to be successful in that position. Um, sometimes it always doesn't work out the way you think it's going to work out. And the French Laundry is a perfect example of that. In my, in my path to the French Laundry, um, I left New York City um, leaving behind a restaurant that, that I built. And the idea of that restaurant was that was going to be my restaurant for my career. Uh, I didn't build it for a short period of time. Uh, I didn't realize that, you know, I didn't set myself up for complete success in a lot of a lot of what happened there was because of me. Of course, there were other things uh, that happened as well. It's never, um, failure is never defined by one thing. Um, it's defined by many. Um, but with that said, you know, moving to, to, to California and to Los Angeles uh, and taking a job um, as a chef I thought was gonna be a great opportunity. I didn't realize it was gonna result in a, um, a, another failure. Um, but those failures resulted in, in driving me to, to this place here in Napa Valley. Um, so uh, I, I only look back and I say, those, without those failures, uh, I wouldn't be here today. Without the ignorance that I had in trying to, 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 to put together a, a business model to buy the French Laundry, um, I wouldn't be here today. So there are many things in, in, in this process towards success um, that we don't realize are going to happen, uh, but have happened. And then there were the little, uh, the little successes along the way that continue to drive me. You know, you, you're, you're successful in small ways, and you wake up the next morning thinking, okay, you're, gonna, you're, you're going to push yourself based on that little success you had yesterday. 
and um, it's, it's a very interesting process, the failure of success. Uh, if you hypothetically had to drop everything and go stage for one chef in the world, who would it be? Hypothetically, if I had to stage for one chef in the world, who would it be? Um, it, it's, it's a good question. I, you know, it's like, where, where, where would you go to eat if you only had one restaurant to eat at? It's, a, that's, it's almost impossible. Um, yeah, I, you know, you stumped me. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, can, I would say, you know, maybe, maybe it's in my, in my own restaurants um, with, with, with David Breeden here at the French Laundry, who's our new chef de cuisine here, or Eli Kamai in, in, in New York. Um, having, having, having a strong cultural and philosophical connection to that kind of food, but having watched them uh, evolve um, our restaurant to uh, 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 not a different place, um, but a new place. That, that has a direct connection to the past. And that's why it, it's so important to me, this idea of evolution. Um, because there are times I'll go into the restaurant and I'll go, oh, how come I didn't think of that? But when I say that, and when I feel that way, it gives me a great sense of confidence and pride because what they're doing is directly connected to what I was doing when I was the chef of those restaurants. And it's, it's a really a wonderful thing to see this evolutionary process, and you see these two restaurants now together and united, it creates a, a truly rapid rate of evolution because now you have you know, 200 individuals working towards the same goal as opposed to 100. That's why I never understood that, that idea that you know, chefs opening more restaurants makes them weaker. It, it only makes them weaker if they haven't planned correctly because if you think about it, you know, between the French Laundry and Per Se, we are now twice as strong as we were when we only had the French Laundry because we have twice as many people focused, twice as many people doing the work, twice as many people evolving what our, what, what, what our culture, what our philosophy, what our repertoire is all about. Oh, so now we have people asking questions, see? We have two minutes left. It's breaking the ice, it's a good thing. We have, we have three minutes left. Yeah, so since you opened the concept of uh, culinary pollution, can you elaborate? Culinary pollution. I, no, I, I just, I just was, was talking about what Enrique was talking about. Uh, um, but uh, what was the question? No, I mean, you say it exists. So what do you mean? Well, I, <laughs> <laughs> no, Enrique was, was talking about his, his, um, his desire not to, not to go on, on, on web, you know, not to go on the internet to explore other things because he just gets confused. It's all this pollution out there. Uh, and it's true, you know, because we, we, we see things that may be attractive to us. We see things that we may want to try. Um, but we could, we, in many ways, we see too many things. And, 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 it, and it creates a, a sense of confusion in, in what we want to do and what we believe. So we do the same thing at the French Laundry. We try not to be influenced by the outside world. We try to be influencers of ourselves. And I think that's a very, very important thing, is not to continue to, to go on the website or to continue to explore everything that's going on. It's, nice, it's, it's a nice knowledge base to know what's going on, but you really have to be able, you have to be truly strongly connected to, to your culture, to your philosophy, to execute your food or your vision with the way you want to do it, not because somebody else is doing something else. One more. So. I mean, you've done so much in your life, opening all these restaurants and everything. You've accomplished so much. What's your next step? What's my next step? That's an interesting question. It's all, see that, <laughs> there's always this ex expectation that there's something next, you know? And, and yes, there probably will, will be something next, but you know, I, I ponder the idea, why does there have to be something next? Why can't we just be satisfied with what we're doing today? We, 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 we have this culture we have this culture, and, and it happens to me all the time when I'm out, you know, and, and whether it's, you know, it's somebody at an event or more, more often than not, somebody in the media going, okay, well, what are you going to do next? It's like, well, I mean, do I have to do something next? Why is always that expectation to do something? I mean, I'm, I, I don't mean to be, you know, to, to, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be rude, but it's sometimes we just have to be satisfied with what we're doing now and focus on what we're doing now. And if we focus on what we're doing now, we'll prepare ourselves with great strength for what will be next, even though we may not know what next is. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>